It's the season. Tornado Alley is on alert. The chaos to come is only a whisper in the wind. And then all hell breaks loose. There is that bell. You see it. We see a huge, huge rotation close to the ground. Tornado's on the ground. We got a funnel on the ground right now, right inside. Tornado on the ground. Debris cloud, debris cloud. There it is. I assure you, this thing is a monster. It is definitely on the ground. Uh, Gary, this is stuff F4 tomato. This thing is big. Tornadoes are the most violent storms on Earth. Multiple vortex tornadoes, very dangerous. Take shelter. Whoa, whoa! Oh my gosh, Gary, it's hitting something right now. One of the most violent tornadoes ever recorded hit Moore, Oklahoma on May 3rd, 1999. Yeah, we have a tornado in Moore. Hold your traffic. I call it the monster. Watching it walk through town, there was literally nothing that we could do. Uh, nothing on the face of the Earth could stop it. It left in its wake an emergency that threatened to overwhelm the system. We were getting calls from my neighbor's house is gone. I can't find my neighbor to calls from out of state. My mother, my father live in war. I can't get a hold of them to my house is on fire. There's a gas leak over here. It was complete and utter chaos. We've got extensive damage. Call in everybody, every available unit. Call them in. Chief Stevens knew that in a town of 50,000, everybody was not nearly enough. Until outside help could arrive, Moore's emergency teams would be on their own. You can have the best training in the world, but you wonder at the time, are you adequately trained for something this magnitude? Would rescue workers be up to it? How would this monstrous storm affect their lives and the lives of those they rescue? It was time to find out. May 3rd, the night of the tornado started out basically as any other day. As the day wore on, the reports of more serious weather were building. Conditions are uh, pretty favorable for some explosive thunderstorm development. While meteorologist Gary England cautioned his viewers about the developing storm, Chief Stevens continued to monitor the weather reports. This particular day was a day that we had a city council meeting. 30 minutes into the meeting, city council members went outside to look at the sky. We walk out to the street and look to the west, and I knew that we were in trouble. It looks like to me, Gary, this thing is rapidly getting organized. It's ro the rotation has gotten much stronger. Val, it's a huge, huge lowering. Yeah. And I want the intensities on the storm are increasing. My deputy chief went up on the roof and was trying to see what he could see from a better viewpoint. So I went up on top of the building and uh, watched the tornado destroy our city. I started hearing an elevation of sound. And uh, of course the thing was traveling like 40 miles an hour. It was moving pretty fast. And I still couldn't make it out. I kept looking and I kept looking, trying to figure out where this was. And it's just like all of a sudden the sound was there. It's running like a big motor starting up. And I still couldn't see the tornado. And then I realized how huge it was. It was the cloud. This is a major tornado of significant proportions. Wind speeds we don't know, but it's going to level most houses. The most powerful winds on the face of the planet are contained in these most violent F5 tornadoes. Wind speeds of 300 miles per hour. It had a path length of about 38 miles. It had a path width of up to a mile. It was so big that it was consuming the whole area that I was looking at. And as it continued on, what it looked like was an upside down Christmas tree. Only it was dark, and lights were going off in it. Lightning, uh, hitting power poles, a lot of electricity, rooftops coming around, exploding like glitter. You would have to call the tornado that hit Moore, Oklahoma, a monster. It basically destroyed just about everything in its path, created total havoc. And it had a rumble to it. You could feel it. You could feel the rumble. My britches legs were moving. And, and it was just huge. It was terrifyingly beautiful. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever saw. And it scared me. 
As the deputy chief watched from the rooftop, the monster destroyed a quarter of the city of Moore. Wherever it got past the McDonald's sign, that's when I realized it was on my house and my wife was in the house. And that's whenever I, I at that point, I really feel like I went into shock. I didn't know what I was going to tell people. I, I sit here and watched my wife get killed and I didn't do anything about it. In just minutes, the cacophony of 911 calls deluged the dispatchers. It was pretty much, what's the problem and where are you at? It was to the point of, you know, I, I can't get out of my house. Well, are you bleeding? Do you have any broken bones? Do you have a head injury? I mean, if they were okay, then the people that did have physical harm were took precedence over them. And we just, you know, we'll, we'll get there. You know, we'll give the information to the fire department, police department. But just be patient with us. One of the problems our firefighters had even within the first few moments after it hit was there were no streets visible. Everything was debris. We couldn't tell where a front yard was versus a street. No, it's this one. It's this one. Get there was in. no way to orient yourself. At the invitation of the Weather Channel, a group of first responders gather at fire station number two to share their stories. And you get in there and you think, okay, this is such and such street, I think. I was a captain here in this district for 11 years, and I knew this district. And I was so lost. And, you know, they would go, we, we think we have someone in the cellar at this address. You have five, six people trapped in a cellar at 2509 Ridgewood. Confirming what? six people trapped in a cellar at Okay, but how do you find this address? I walked for over a block and never touched the ground. What's the number? Never. It was just solid rubbish. We inched our way as fast as we could through the debris. My biggest fear was the power lines. Jim Cochran and his partner dodged the danger as best they could. We went probably, oh, maybe another half a mile, three quarters of a mile, and we got to the apartment buildings. Uh, the apartment buildings were three-story apartment complexes that were nothing but rubble, just big piles of rubble. Jim didn't know it at the time, but Jennifer Bryles, her grandmother, and Jennifer's five-day-old daughter were buried beneath the rubble, desperately waiting to be rescued. Marissa was born on April 28th, just five days later, Jenny and her grandmother had dragged a mattress into the bathtub and huddled with the baby for safety. And then the radio, the lights, everything went out, completely out. Sirens were going off, and next thing we know, horrible noise, horrible. Like 10, 15 freight trains going over you. We heard the windows break in, everything in the apartment just break. You you could hear all that and um, then you could feel this suction like you're gonna like you can't breathe when it was coming over you could not breathe it was like sucking all the air out of you the wall came down on us and we were crushed in there you know we were, could not breathe no air whatsoever and then the water started leaking I can remember hollering for help I can remember saying I got a newborn in here. Uh, my grandma's dying. Help me, help me, help me. Hello! Here. Help was on the way. It took a terrifying 45 minutes for rescuers to dig through the rubble. When someone's trapped in rubble, they're, they're very, very scared. They start digging off the rubble. And I kept telling them, I was like, stop, stop. It's going to come down on us. You've got to quit. It's going to come down on us. There's nails in it. Go easy. They're very, very nervous. And so your job is to, to not only treat them and assess them, but to also reassure them and calm them down. They kept on digging, and finally, they pulled off that one piece of the apartment. They pulled it off, and you could feel. It just felt like, oh, it felt so good to breathe that fresh air and everything and they pulled it off they said give me the baby gave him the baby I was surprised to see a baby that small and I was surprised to see a baby 
that small on hurt. Everybody okay. You take a three-story building, make it into a pile of rubble, and then pull a, what, four days old baby out of it, un unhurt, that's quite a miracle in my opinion, you know. It was a moment of joy and a night of terror. The depth of Jim's feelings would come later, after the long night was over. Being a paramedic, you really have to fall back on your training. And you can't let your emotional or personal feelings get involved. If they do, you might cloud your judgment as far as what you're doing for the patient. I got a red and yellow. As far as the emotional impact that, that gets you later, uh, and, and it will. Well. Thank you for saving me and my baby and my grandma. I think that as first responders, we all do our job, and it's only afterwards that we realize that we not only have our own suffering to deal with because of what we have seen, but we also bear the sorrow that we experience from the people who told us their stories. I guess it's kind of like everybody always says, you didn't have time to have any emotional reactions other than we just had a job to do and we just tried to do the best we could at the time. I don't think any really emotional impact for me was until about midnight when I finally was able to contact my family and make sure that they were okay. And just knowing they were safe, I guess it was kind of finally sunk into me right then that this was a big, big deal. We've got another funnel, probably a mile or a half a mile, I got it, half a mile behind the first, it's on the ground. There's two tornadoes on the ground right now. Directly behind the other one. Okay, we see it, we see the funnel. This is a smaller funnel, yeah. it's a little bit to the left, it's right above the, yeah, right there. Yeah. And that's, that's to the left of the major funnel. Right. Gee, many. Yes, Look right. at that. This was a situation that was kind of hard to predict ahead of time. All the pieces, it was not obvious that all the pieces were going to come together just as needed for a major tornado outbreak. We are tracking it as we drive along in the uh, storm uh, tornado. But once the thunderstorms formed on this occasion, they quickly began to rotate, and that rotation was readily detected by Doppler radars, leading to very timely warnings. You have time, you probably still have a few minutes in more to move to a place of safety. This is Moore, here's Newcastle, it's getting ready to cross the river, it's moving north, northeast to the Moore area. Without accurate forecasts and warnings in this case, the death toll could have been much higher, it could have been in the hundreds. Midwest Regional Hospital, 75 plus injured, two confirmed fatalities. Southwest Medical Center, 75 plus victims. St. Anthony's, nine injured. Norman Regional, 30 injured. Some critically, one confirmed dead now. 44 people died in this tornado, five of them in Moore. Moore's deputy fire chief was terrified his wife Karen would be among them. As far as you can see, to the west, every house was gone. We've got massive damage. We're going to have to stop here. The trees were stripped so bare that it really did look like a nuclear bomb had hit the area. It reminded me of pictures of Hiroshima. As rescuers scrambled to respond, their training took over. We're going to have to deal with it, you know, and, and you're thinking, okay, we don't. What are we going to do first? Well, we're going to do surface rescue. We're going to go through there, walk through the area, and get people we can get out quick. Where do you want me to set up? If we can, let's uh, look around First Baptist Church and see if that's going to work as a command. I set command at First Baptist Church. After I had been there just a few moments, we started having, I started having people come up to me, literally walking out of these residential neighborhoods coming to the church and they started asking me questions, where can I get help? Thinking of his wife and with a sinking heart, the chief's deputy, Jerry Dozier, headed home, directly into the path of the tornado. Jerry was on the radio. Uh, he took the west end of town. Uh, I could tell by the tone of his voice that um, his end of town was not good. My house was in the center, right in the dead center of it. I'm going to try to fly there and see what's going on before I can make it into work. 133, take care of your family first. I knew she was dead. I knew, I, I had total confidence that she was dead, but I had a lot of hope that I was wrong. I'm, I'm wrong all the time. I had a lot of hope that, well, the tornado went further away than what I thought. It wasn't, it didn't really hit my house. It, it went someplace else different than that. 
it came from this way here and moved out towards that way. I was in a bedroom closet about right there. I heard everything crashing, everything flying around. You could hear it all. And then at one point, a big rush of cool air came in from under me. And I knew at that time it had picked the house up off the foundation. And that's when I was really, really scared. At this point, Jerry was still a few blocks away. It's like things go into slow motion. You, you can't move fast enough, but you're always trying to play catch up with a, a disaster. You can't prepare for a disaster that nobody else has experienced. It's so big, you know, this was the biggest tornado and it's on the ground and, and uh, it, was, it was really more than I could handle. We have a very significant, possibly deadly tornado on the ground. That, that's where it is right now. It's as, just as big as it's ever been. Um, it's got a massive circulation with it. Yeah, we see the whole, whole darn thing coming down again, Val. Yeah, and uh, it's headed in a bad direction. I just prayed. That's all there was left to do, was to pray. Uh, as, as the tornado started to leave, the winds caught me and sucked me out from the, the place where I was. And I said to myself at that time, this is the day I'm going to die. You can see the path where the tornado light area runs across our city through Oklahoma City. My house is located right in there, in this area. There was a tiny little hole right above my head and I reached my arm up. I pushed a, like a two by four off of me and I had bricks down the left side of me and I stuck my head up through that hole and uh, it was over. There was debris all over the place right here. There was things laying in the street. I came on up out of the hole and there wasn't anyone else around at that point. No one else had come out yet. She was walking off the curb, and that's when I seen her first walking off the curb, and I pulled up and stopped. There wasn't anything left. There were no houses on either side of me, in front of me, in back of me. There wasn't anything. She said when she walked out, she thought she was the only person alive because it was all gone. At first, I was so overwhelmed with it, I, I could hardly keep from crying. And then whenever I found her and found she was okay, it's like I did a primary search to find out if she had broken bones, and then I just went into the firefighter mode, and I was okay from that point. And then people started coming from everywhere. I knew I couldn't move. I knew something was stuck to the side of my head. I didn't know what it was. Here we have a tornado on the ground, a brief touchdown. I see it. We've got dust, dirt, and debris on the ground right now. Tornado on the ground. There it is. We stack her in surreal. Okay, this thing is getting bigger. It's a big circulation on the ground. It looks like it could be multiple vortex to me from here. I remember every bit of it, every second of it, it seems like. It was like a, a great big long bomb went off and you were standing in the, the pit of it all and nothing to work with. But dozens of injured people came to Jerry for help. It was incredibly frustrating. You think about somebody has a cut, well, okay, you can apply pressure to it, you can put a bandage on it. Well, we didn't have any bandages. We didn't tear up a sheet. There was no clean sheets. It's like someone took everything that there was and put it in a great big mud bucket, and everything was dirty, so anything you did made things worse. Rescue workers urged the wounded to walk out of the devastation. If they could walk, we let them walk. And those are people we normally would have treated on a normal incident. They had to help themselves and their neighbors dug them out. I don't know how many people was actually rescued by neighbors. I mean, so like you said, it was just, uh, how many people actually ended up there at, at Southwest Medical? 
Well, that night we probably treated 120, uh, but of the admissions we had like 30 that came and got admitted. And of that, then we also did 18 cases, surgical cases at that night. Chris Carey had watched the tornado from the roof of the hospital. I was at uh, the hospital, which is the tallest building in South Oklahoma City, and could actually see it moving through. Ranger 9 confirms power flashes, Gary. Ranger 9 confirms, Ranger 9 confirms power flashes. You could see transformers blowing, uh, almost like Christmas lights popping uh, as they went through. And I could see the tornado pass, and so I came down to the emergency room at that stage. When the tornado struck, Carey was the only general surgeon on duty. I was simply amazed by all of a sudden that five minutes you go from really one or two patients being there to organized chaos, as you said before. I mean, probably 20 or 30 different victims in there being brought in mostly by passenger car while people were at the scenes. Then each person had a story. Julie Rakestraw's story is one of the most remarkable. We have debris. It's ripping trees out of the ground at this point. It was extremely loud. Didn't really sound like freight trains or anything to me. It's just, you know, death. That was it. It was coming. It continues to be a very intense, possibly deadly tornado. You need to be below ground shelter. Julie and her 10-year-old daughter, Michelle, were only able to scramble to a hall closet when the tornado hit. My main concern was to keep Michelle as calm as possible. Like, you know, half my brain was saying, oh, everything's going to be fine, and, you know, it's just going to be over very quickly and all this and stuff. And the rest of me is like, okay, it's time to meet my maker. And the next moment, the walls and stuff were gone, and it felt like I was being slapped upside the head with a tree branch. But uh, after it was over and done with, I mean, it's like, okay, the house is gone because I can see down the block. And it's like, couldn't see that before. The forces from a tornado wind themselves are bad enough. They'll push against the wall and pull up the roof and, and cause destruction. But even worse is the fact that the tornado contains debris, flying pieces of metal and wood and glass. Debris within a tornado is part of the death and destruction mechanism. I knew I couldn't move. I knew something was stuck to the side of my head. I didn't know what it was. I knew I was in pain. Part of a two by four was protruding from Julie's neck. A team of surgeons saved her life. This is the board that actually went in my head. She was blessed uh, by the fact that all the cogs of the wheel that were in line, the fact that she was immediately seen at the scene by someone that knew something about medicine to stabilize this two by four, to not take it out, the OR crew being available, it just all fell in place. And uh, she was a very, very lucky lady from that aspect. I don't ever want to go through that again. Uh, I didn't think there was anything that scary. Yes. It was terrifying. Another large tornado coming down at this time. My God. I'm assuming the roof came off first and it sucked the horses out. Because when it was all over, all the animals were outside. Yes, uh, we're heading right into the uh, the path of the thing on I-44, Gary. It's uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's absolutely enormous, and we see a number of other uh, a no number of other tornadoes. Uh, I guess skirting on uh, just uh, one side of it. The tornado was an F5 on the Fujita scale, meaning it had winds as high as 300 miles per hour. Tornadoes are rated by the damage they do. You won't find those winds anywhere else on the earth. You won't find them in hurricanes. You won't find them in the jet stream. You won't find them on the top of the highest mountains in the strongest of winter storms. You'll only find them in those violent F5 tornadoes. Uh, the wind speeds are quite strong with it, we fear. Uh, we've seen some damage that's been phenomenal. Oh my God, it's all the way through it. It was incredible. I mean, you could see it on TV, but there's nothing that I could describe it without seeing it in person. 
Within hours of the tornado, Red Cross teams were in place. And we had a couple people up that had been in World War II and things that were just comparing it to that. I mean, they had never seen anything that bad. We need some people to start blocking off, sealing off this area. We got and there was cars on tops of trees and tops of houses. Like from us, when we were doing some of the search and rescue, the houses that we were actually in had came from across the road or across the other side. Dear God, you see this as many times as you want. and. That to me is just, that just leaves me speechless. That's, wow. We describe the winds of these F5 tornadoes as being incredible. They'll completely take homes and break them up into tiny bits, sweep them away from the foundation, blow them hundreds of yards downstream. What was along here? And how was it attached to the concrete? And if anyone is in their path, the chances of survival are not very good. We've got extensive damages. I don't know how far she flew or what hit her. Uh, we're this lucky to still have her. Holly is the Chamber's family's favorite mare. She was in their barn when the tornado hit. When it was over, the barn was leveled and Holly was 600 yards away. I had a pickup in the garage that flew four or five hundred feet. So <laughs> she's a lot lighter than a pickup truck. I have no idea, you know, where she went or how she made it out. Veterinarian Mike Wiley had never seen anything like it. What happens when there's that much wind speed and that much debris? Uh, it's just, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing anything lived through it. leave your house and everything's in order and everything's where it's supposed to be, you know, come back two or three hours later and it's just gone. And I mean, we're not talking about it's just blown over or the roof's gone. I mean, it's just gone. There are splinters left. The Chambers family was safe, but Carrie's horses were gravely wounded. I had two horses outside and two horses in the barn, and um, I'm glad I wasn't there. I mean, I don't have any idea how the how the horses got out of the barn. The uh, stalls were more or less like these, and it looked like a trash compactor had got a hold of them. The barn hadn't protected the horses, but what would? Researchers at Texas Tech are finding out. Okay. Yep. Three. Three, two, one. Traveling at 100 miles per hour, this 2x4 goes straight through typical wooden siding. Three, two, one. The target missile is stopped only by steel reinforced concrete based between two walls of brick. and this at a speed lower than the one that threw Holly out of the chamber's barn. That's our house and that was the big red barn. There's our wedding pictures that made it. Where's my baby book? The important things are the memories, uh, baby book, Cody. the pictures, the living, the breathing. You know, and you realize that when you're digging through all that stuff, it's just stuff. <laughs> And I get on my hands and knees and I cover my head and the windows start to shatter. Chris Halsney takes you on a tour of the destruction. Westmore High School, with its cars still littering the parking lot, is just to the left. The homes where most of the kids who went to that school live are gone. A tornado with the power to level entire neighborhoods is a tornado of maximum force. Researchers were using a portable mobile Doppler radar to measure the winds in this Oklahoma City tornado that day. Their preliminary measurements indicated 318 miles per hour. That would be the fastest mile per hour of the Fujita F5 category. Since we know that not all tornadoes are 
equally intense, but we don't have measurements of all of them. We have to use the damage they produced as a way to rate them, and that's where the Fujita scale comes in. F-Zero tornadoes produce cosmetic damage, awnings and shingles. F-1, you'll have more substantial damage to the roofs. By the time the winds reach F-2 scale, the roofs will be gone, mobile homes will be overturned. F-3, some of the walls are knocked down. F-4, basically brick and wooden structures are knocked down into piles of rubble. F-5, pretty much all the structures in the path have been blown away, swept clear of their foundations. This neighborhood between Santa Fe and I-35 and south of 104th Street is one of the most heavily damaged, the widest path of the storm. Kelly Elementary School sits off to the right, obliterated. Fortunately, teachers and students had already gone for the day. And as soon as we got home, um, it um, was coming, and so we had to get in the bathtub, and I have a dog, and she got in there too with us. My mom was going to um, go to our ball game, but something was telling her not to go, and so she stayed home, and then when the tornado came, um, we stayed there, and we stayed there for like the whole night. The students live behind the school at East Lake Subdivision, an area devastated by the storm. My room was still there. I can't believe that the tornado was right in front of my house and my room was not damaged any. What about the rest of your house? Was that, was that damaged? Yeah. You should have seen my brother Cooper's room. His room was like um, destroyed. It is moving toward Westmore in southwest Oklahoma City. It has left an incredible trail of damage. It continues to be a very intense, possibly deadly tornado. You need to be below ground sheltered. For Tyrese and his family, May 3rd was a Monday afternoon like any other, until the family saw the tornado on television. Let me tell you folks, this is deadly, deadly serious. Take your tornado precautions, do it now. Get in the bathtub, get, put the kids in the bathtub, get in on top of the kids. This is an extremely deadly tornado. And I go, whoa, Dad, look. And uh, he's like, uh, we're, it's not going to hit us. You have time. You probably still have a few minutes in more to move to a place of safety. Not much. My mom dabs the baby. And where should we go? The closet or the bathtub? And my uncle just has the bathtub, so we, we run in there. And I get on my hands and knees and I cover my head. My mom starts crying. And right before, like, the window starts to shatter, I, I tell her, I say, Mom, I love you. Mom, I love you. And the window starts to shatter. Everything, all the voices started fading out. And all I could hear is the wind, powerful winds and stuff. And then bricks and stuff was hitting my back. When it was over, Danette Rogers hadn't survived. Her children were wounded. Tyrese was taken to the nearest hospital, Southwest Medical, becoming one of Chris Carey's 18 surgical patients. Most of those people that first came in had just almost like shrapnel burns. I mean, where the gravel and trees and limbs would hit them. But it was just uh, amazing to me, from my side, what I saw. I can't imagine what it was down in the heart of the storm. Come on, come on, come on. Joshua Werman can. As a meteorologist for the University of Oklahoma, his job was to get as close to the tornado as possible. Please go ahead five miles and deploy. The tornado's to the north of the road. Go five miles as quickly as you can. Okay. Werman was operating one of the university's two Doppler on wheels trucks. For severe weather researchers like Joshua, this tornado was the opportunity of a lifetime. Okay, down two, just FYI, the tornado is north of the road about a mile and is about five miles east of us. So you'll be deploying sort of to its south. 
Working in tandem, the scientists maneuver to focus both Doppler trucks at the tornado. This allows them to triangulate wind speed and direction inside the funnel. When we get very, very close, we can see very, very small details. It's as if you were looking at your hand, but instead of looking at arm's length, you were getting up very, very close so you could see the fingerprints. On May 3rd, Worman got close enough to record these fingerprints. At times, these winds are approaching 318 miles an hour. The Doppler picked up what few have ever seen, the eye of the tornado. Oh yeah, look at that. That's stronger. Nice. Oh yeah, that's quite strong. That's actually gone yeah. back to zero and plus, nice. so that's up at that's a tornado, 20 right? meters per second now. That's getting stronger. Yeah. Oh yeah, here it comes. The data from May 3rd is still being analyzed and is greatly contributing to our knowledge of tornadoes. We're much better now than we used to be in forecasting well in advance the most dangerous of these severe weather outbreaks. We're better now because we have better tools. We have more sophisticated satellites. We have powerful radars. We have more powerful computers. Right now, it's moving. Dell City, Tinker, Moore. This tornado is certainly going to go down as one of the most significant of all time. There's mobile Doppler radar data on this. It's a well-documented tornado that will really be important toward our future understanding of how tornadoes form and their structure. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, many times. Yeah, it's headed right at me. I got it in my camera view. It's headed right in front of me. I certainly find tornadoes both beautiful as well as scary forces to be respected. In some cases, tornadoes may have a hypnotic effect to them that you can't believe that one is headed right to you. You're almost spellbound by the symmetry of it and the grace in some cases of it. It's swirling motions to the point that some people have become almost petrified or paralyzed or hypnotized standing motionless in the street, even literally as it began to threaten their lives. The public has a fascination with tornadoes, they love to watch tornado videos, but I think anyone who's experienced one would give a much different uh, opinion of tornadoes. They would really describe them as monsters that have changed their lives forever. Uh, used to, I thought, not us, not me. But uh, after it walked through town May 3rd, I know better now. Numerous gas lines have been busted. No smoking. People are amazingly resilient. They cope with amazing tragedies in their lives. And they come out of it with a renewed sense of purpose. Mom. That's your mom. See? See, mom, she's pretty. She's got brown hair like yours. I'm doing good now. Whenever I think about her, I draw her and I get out her pictures and look off of them and draw them. The most vivid memory is my wife standing there alive, dripping wet, muddy all over, her hair hanging down in her face, uh, cold and, and scared. This whole deal wasn't about the material things of losing a house. You know, you can replace a house. It wasn't about any of the, of where you were going to live or your clothes. The whole idea was that you were alive. And everything I loved was alive. Did she get nervous when thunderstorms come through? Holly was nine days pregnant with Twister before the tornado. Twister's a nice colt, and it's amazing that he made it through all that. A symbol that, you know, life will go on. We will survive. Um, triumph. This is the part of the tornado that we want to remember. This is our rebuilding. That's what he means to me. And uh, he'll probably grow up and won't be worth nothing, but he's worth everything to us. This is absolutely incredible. I tell you, this is deadly serious. We've been talking about it for an hour or two now. The damage is massive. And I'm surprised how many people actually survived it. It amazes me because from the sand, it should have wiped everybody out. 
I didn't think there was anything that scary. I'll never forget it. <laughs> No one think a six-day-old baby would survive through a tornado and all that rubber and everything, but she did. She did. Oh, look at you. She had a guardian angel right along with all of the rest of us. Say hi. Say so they're what this time? Hi, sweetie. <laughs> Say hi. Say hello. Hello. Say hello. thank hello. you. <laughs> hello. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, many times. How you doing? Good. Good. I thank God every single day that, you know, we have people like that. I, I owe them a great thanks. I owe them a lot. For rescued and rescuers alike, all of us are vulnerable to the monster's unpredictable fury. You train and you train and you train for years and you do the same thing over and over and Sometimes you wonder, why are we doing this? But uh, now we know.